In this video, I want to continue our discussion of the history of computers by looking at them generationally. Now, in the earliest days, we have mechanical computers. And we're going to call this Generation Zero because this is before electronic computers, before digital computers, the type of things we think of today as computers. In this period of time, uh, mechanical computers were a wonder. Prior to this, and of course during this time, the term computer was actually used to refer to human beings who did calculating work. Right? So guys with those uh, little green beanies all sitting in a room doing calculations for big business, that kind of thing. Now, in as early as the mid-1640s, uh, we see the introduction of a mechanical calculating machine uh, introduced by Blaise Pascal. Now, one is pictured here on the right. And this machine could do addition and subtraction primarily uh, by setting these rotating dials that you see here to different va values that were decimals. So each dial represents a digit from 0 to 9. Uh, in the little holes that we see here in the top are printed results for individual digits. Again, 0 through 9. So this is a decimal calculator. Now this machine could also perform uh, multiplication and division. Uh, but it didn't do it directly, it did it through iteration. So you could repeat the same addition a certain number of times without having to change the dials, and you would effectively get, say, multiplication. Now, within 30 years, we also see devices uh, like those, like the one introduced by Leibniz, that could perform multiplication and division automatically. But it's critical to understand here that the mechanical power that moves the internal gears and cogs of these machines comes from human force. Now one of the reasons this particular machine, Pascal's calculating machine, was so important was he is the first to successfully uh, prepare a machine like this for market. It was originally designed for his father's uh, business, but he was able to make this machine that could resist um, extensive amounts of human force uh, and that was critical in making this thing reliable over time. Now we skip forward to the 1800s and we'll remind ourselves of Charles Babbage and Ada Lovelace and the difference in analytical engines that they worked on. Uh, and then in another big leap forward in time we get to the 1930s. And this is where we start to approach the types of computers that we think of today, at least electronic computers. Now in the 1930s uh, Conrad Zeus introduced what was known as the Zeus calculator, and this was based on electromagnetic relays. And I'll, I'll take a moment in a minute to make you more acquainted with what that means to be an electromagnetic computer. By the 1940s, computers uh, were able to do calculations uh, based on memories, right? And so capacitors, which are effectively batteries, tiny batteries, um, that can be charged up and then have the charge released uh, could represent pieces of information. Now if we want to think about a binary piece of information, we can think of these capacitors as being uh, discharged and containing a zero or charged and containing a one. Now just like any battery you're familiar with, they lose their viability over time. And so these things have to be able to take on new values quickly, so they charge quickly, so they're not big batteries. When such a capacitor is, say, charged to hold a uh, one, it will slowly fade into a zero. And so these particular capacitor-based memories had to be periodically jogged or recharged to maintain their value. Right. Now this is the, uh, a clear predecessor of what we would call uh, modern DRAM. Uh, and in the 40s, uh, the same gentleman, Conrad Zeus, he creates uh, what is notably the first high-level language, uh, and I won't attempt uh, to pronounce it, uh, but it, the uh, German here means um, planned calculus, if I, if I recall this right. So it was a calculus-based language, and what makes it a high-level language, unlike the languages before it, uh, 
was that it was wholly disconnected from the nature of the machine instructions uh, of the hardware it might run on. And in this way, it became, uh, it was theoretically in some ways, platform independent. Now, I said I wanted to take a moment to cover a bit about electromagnetic computing, so we're going to do that here. Now, before you is a device you may all be familiar with uh, from storybooks, given your age. Uh, but when I was younger, of course, we actually did use typewriters uh, and learned to, t uh, learned to type in grade school. Now you learn to type on a keyboard. But a typewriter is a simple, somewhat simple, mechanical device. Uh, and to get a letter printed on a particular piece of paper. A human finger uh, exerts some force onto one of these keys, and that force is transferred uh, along the pieces of metal until a little hammer goes wah -wah. And that hammer will have the correct letter on it. It'll smash a piece of uh, ribbon that's uh, impregnated with ink against a piece of paper, leaving the impression of a letter that you typed on the paper. Astounding. Now, this is a very simple device, as we said. But this is the fundamental nature by which all these zeroth generation machines basically worked. If something moved to help with a part of a calculation, that movement was often the result of force uh, applied by one or more human beings. And obviously, that is a tiresome thing, and you can't do big computations with just human force. Right? So to do things better, we need some way to alleviate that particular um, stress. And so electromagnetic computing, computing, if we take this typewriting metaphor, is effectively like adding a power supply and a solenoid. So in this simplistic diagram, we have a power supply that goes to a button. And this is a primitive button, something where some power comes along from the battery, and then uh, the button is disconnected in its normal state. And when a human being applies minimal pressure to that button here, uh, the circuit is connected, and the source of power moves forward into that uh, solenoid. Then uh, the solenoid actuates and hits the key. Uh, with a predetermined amount of force that's regulated by the power in the battery right? and uh, any other circuits that are involved. So instead of the actions of the mechanical part of the machine being powered by human force, now they're effectively powered by uh, electricity and some kind of solenoid actuators or actuators at large. That takes us to what we can definitely refer to as the first generation of uh, modern electronic computers. And these computers were based primarily on the technology of vacuum tubes. These were tubes within which a vacuum could be uh, created or relieved uh, via an electronic stimulus. So in World War II, these vacuum tube-based computers uh, like the Colossus, helped beat the Enigma code. Um, uh, there was an important computer uh, introduced in 1946 called the ENIAC. This thing had 18,000 tubes and about 1,500 electromagnetic relays in it. And to program it, you had to use jumpers and multi-state switches. Now when I say jumpers, I mean uh, like you see in old television shows where an operator uh, is receiving a request for a phone call. She might pull out uh, a cable and stick it into some hole on her operator's board. These are jumper cables from that period, not like the jumper cables uh, or the, uh, uh, the little jumpers that you put inside of your personal computers today. So we have all these jumpers, all these multi-state switches, uh, and Kapow, you know, computing explodes. All kinds of machines based on this technology start to show up. And of course, they all have names that relate back uh, to the ENIAC, or at least uh, pay homage to it. The EDSAC, the Johnny-AC, uh, the ILIAC, and uh, the Maniac. 
uh, although it wasn't during this particular period of time. It was a little bit later, but uh, later on, a cardboard-based computer for children was introduced, also called the Cardiac. Now, von Neumann, uh, John von Neumann, was this researcher on that ENIAC project. Uh, and one of the things that he did with that particular product was move it away uh, from 10 tubes used for each digit down to one. So we have to imagine that we need to store a number. And before this, the computers were storing values in a decimal form, just like the calculation machine from Blaise Pascal. Uh, when we have 10 tubes sort of in a row, each one of the tubes can represent a different digit. So if uh, the one that's all the way over here is on, that means it's a zero. And if the one on the opposite end of the group of 10, let's say if they were just in a line, is on, that's a nine and in between of the different digit values. Uh, and it's easy to understand how that might work, but that means for every digit, you need 10 individual tubes. So with the ENIAC, John von Neumann switched the computer from decimal to binary, in which each digit is represented by either a 0 or a 1 conceptually, and that requires only one tube that can be off for 0 and on for a 1. And this has the fundamental benefit of drastically reducing uh, the number of tubes required in a machine to represent values of a particular size or a particular magnitude. And if you have fewer tubes, you need fewer jumpers and you need fewer switches. Better yet, the switches, at least some percentage of them that we used to have that we would turn like the ones in um, Pascal's calculator to represent some value from zero or crank it all the way up to nine, we don't need those anymore. We don't need a mechanical switch that has multiple states. We just need buttons or plugs or something simple like that. And removing tubes and removing switches and reducing jumpers means the physical size of this machine can start to be reduced. Now we're talking about a huge machine still, but it's significantly smaller than its predecessors. Uh, a smaller machine means that uh, signals that are over here that need to travel all the way here to the other end of the machine travel a significantly shorter distance. And while the electricity may move at near the speed of light with some drag, 30%, let's say, it still has to travel. So if you cut down the size of the machine in half physically between its extreme points, you are very likely to at least double the speed of the machine. Not to mention the fact that it doesn't have as many tubes. And these tubes were made of glass. So you had tremendous amount of heat being generated by so many tubes next to each other, and they would crack. If you have fewer of them, you're not going to have to replace as many so the device is cheaper, let alone the fact that you didn't put all of them in in the first place, which already made it cheaper. But then you're generating less heat, so they don't even crack as much, the ones that are left behind. There's all kinds of interesting advantages that come as a side effect of moving the machine from decimal to binary. Now, everything is not perfect. Uh, humans still do all their mathematics, of course, in decimal, right? Uh, and we will talk at a, in a later video about some of the complications of doing binary arithmetic uh, in a machine when we're trying to make calculations that we implement in our software based on human decimal mathematics. So after the ENIAC, von Neumann then moves on to be a part of one of those machines I mentioned before called the EDSAC. And this is an extremely important machine as well. The EDSAC uh, introduced uh, the concept that we would take the computer programs that we read in, and we would read them into the same memory in which we store data. And then we would execute it from memory rather than directly off of, say, the punch cards or paper tape, whatever it might be. As a side effect, we effectively have the first stored program computer. Now, there was another 
computer before that, uh, the Mark I or Mark II, I can't recall which, uh, that technically was the first stored program computer, but it was more of a toy in the sense that it couldn't store programs of any um, useful size, whereas the EDSAC, EDSAC could. Uh, and the architecture behind this, where we're storing code and data in the same space, that architecture uh, became known as the von Neumann architecture uh, and has fundamentally influenced uh, the design of all the computers after it. Now it's important to note, and I've got this here in red, that before this, uh, code was code and data was data, and they had different physical media. But by being able to load code to execute directly from memory, we suddenly blurred the line. And so before, code was not thought of as data in any way. But now they are sort of uh, one and the same. Uh, the code is in memory just like data is in memory. And we can't necessarily determine by looking at some arbitrary bytes whether or not those bits are intended to be data uh, like, uh, I don't know, the number of uh, marbles in the marble factory, or uh, part of the binary machine code for some instruction to execute. Instead, we determine this by actually executing the code from some known starting location. So the von Neumann architecture can be diagrammed uh, fairly simply like this. Uh, the core of it is the central processing unit, or CPU. And the CPU is primarily constructed of three major units, which you uh, must internalize. Uh, the ALU, or arithmetic logic unit. Uh, this is the cluster of digital logic that performs the additions, the subtractions, uh, the comparisons, uh, and the uh, binary operations. There's the registers, which is where we keep all our little clusters of bits that we can store values in uh, after we've calculated them uh, via the ALU or retrieve them from uh, some input device or from memory. And then the third thing in there in the middle is the control unit. And it regulates uh, or it controls the transfer of information to and from the registers and the ALU as well as from the CPU uh, to its connecting devices that go to either output or from input or back and forth to system memory. It's also worth noting that while von Neumann uh, came up with his model independently, he was effectively rediscovering the same model that Babbage and Lovelace used in their designs. What von Neumann referred to as the CPU was effectively the same thing as uh, the mill in Babbage's machine. Uh, what von Neumann called memory was the same thing as Babbage's store. And the input uh, for these machines, uh, while they may have been paper tape in von Neumann's days or punch cards, uh, these were still also referred to as cards by Babbage. So no big changes effectively here. From here we move on to the second generation of computers which are fundamentally based on the introduction of a new and uh, seemingly simple technology called the transistor. So these were introduced by Bell Labs in 1948 and by 1956 uh, the inventors had won the Nobel Prize in Physics for its introduction. Uh, MIT introduces a 16-bit transistorized experimental computer, the TX0. Uh, and based on its design, uh, DEC produces a very important machine called the PDP-1 in 1961. And that's what's pictured here uh, on the slide. Uh, and this is an extremely advanced machine in comparison to the concept of people running around plunking in uh, jumper cables by the sheer fact that you can see this video game called Space War playing here. Now, uh, this is, uh, it may look fancier than it really is, uh, but this is a, a pretty cool thing. And you see the two gentlemen in the photograph playing with the peripheral devices, uh, like some kind of joystick. Now, uh, the PDP-1 had uh, an amazing speed. 
of 200 kilohertz. I mean, this is outstanding CPU speeds, uh, but they were costly, around $120,000, and so many dozens were sold, or we should say only many dozens were sold. And by today's standards, when I, this video is recorded in 2018, that's a little bit less than the equivalent of a million dollars. Now, before we move forward, I want to take some time to, to help you understand what it is that a transistor is, because you'll hear things like transistor counts are high over and over and over again uh, in your life. So we need to have a basic idea of what a transistor is. Uh, and so I've got one drawn up here. Transistor is effectively a very small telegraph switch. So remember, uh, we've heard this concept already of the telegraph switch. You can have a, a wire coming in over here, uh, and there could be another wire touching it that lets its signal go out the other end. But if that wire is disconnected, like in an old-style telegraph switch that think Morse code, doo -doo 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 -doo, if it's disconnected, uh, then this signal isn't making it through. Right? When it's connected, it is. Right? Now, all of those elements are here in a transistor. The transistor has three primary pins. There's the collector pin, and that's like the input source of our telegraph switch. Then there's the emitter, which is like the output line of our telegraph switch. And then the basis pin is an electronic way to do the equivalent of the human pushing down the button. So if the basis pin uh, gets a high voltage, uh, the circuit is connected, and whatever is coming in on the collector comes out on the emitter side. And that's all a transistor fundamentally is. Now, there's more than one kind of transistor, uh, but they all effectively provide the same basic functionality. And so uh, recall again that discussion of the ant versus the swarm to uh, be your metaphor for computing. This is the ant. The transistor is the modern ant. It barely does anything. It just effectively makes a connection to allow a signal to be routed through. And yet, from this, we get an explosion of computing technology. Two years after the DEC PDP-1 was introduced in 1961, DEC introduces the PDP-8. 1963. I want to draw your attention to this material on the uh, right here because this device, the uh, device as if it's small, this big computer, the PDP-8, uh, cost only around $18,000, which is about $150K today. Now, realize, compared to the cost of the PDP-1 at $120,000 then, $18,000. This is a price that's effectively down by 85%. Similarly, there were only several dozens of those sold, uh, of the PDP-1 sold. So if we decide to give them the benefit of the doubt and say it was basically 100, uh, you know, we're still talking about a 500 times uh, improvement in sales. That is a huge deal. Now, the PDP-8 uh, is not only worth noting because it shows how quickly the technology was evolving as a side effect of this transistor technology, but it introduced a fundamental component to systems that we still see today, and it was a big deal. And this, at the time, was called the Omnibus. And the Omnibus was a big it was a, a big technical subsystem of the DEC PDP-8. Effectively, whenever you hear this term bus, uh, like in the diagram uh, here at the bottom of, of the slide, we really just mean a bunch of wires in parallel that allow data to go from one place to another place more than one bit at a time. Now, it's not quite as simple as just a bunch of wires, but that's basically the idea as far as we as computer scientists are concerned. There's some additional digital logic involved to make sure that if uh, multiple devices, like what we see here, like the CPU, memory, uh, and the I.O. devices, if they're all hooked up 
to a common bus, in this case the omnibus, then there must be additional logic so that when the CPU tries to retrieve information from uh, a specific device along the bus, there must be logic that allows that uh, the device uh, that's targeted to acquire the request uh, and have the rest of the devices ignore it. Right? So, uh, but that digital logic is pretty minimal. We don't have the skills at the moment to discuss it, so we have to put that off to a later date or a later video. Now, what made the omnibus special was not just the idea that many things were connected to a, the same pipeline of wires. That was already there. What made the omnibus unique was that many of these different elements along the omnibus could be removed from the bus uh, and then have something else put in. Now it's not exactly the same kind of plug-and-play type technology we have today where you just move any old card anywhere, um, but it's the same fundamental concept. So instead of everything being this hardwired backplane in the system, the major components could be individually removed with ease and replaced or duplicated. Right? And so this is an important part of the evolution of modern machines. In 1964, uh, the CDC 6600 was introduced. This is also an important machine pictured here on the right. It had very uh, highly parallel arithmetic. Uh, and so you didn't have to do a bunch of individual additions one after another to take, say, uh, an array of, of 10 integers and add one to each of them. Uh, it was possible with this particular machine to take many integers at a time and have them all uh, incremented. Now, this particular machine, while important, was very difficult to program. Uh, but it also had another interesting feature, and that was that it had 10 inner computers. Now, if you remember back to this notion of the personal motor, where we, a family had a motor that they hooked peripheral devices up to, and then later in time, they still needed the functionality of those peripheral devices, but they weren't peripheral anymore. They all had their own motors. This is kind of that same concept starting to evolve in computing we had a central processing unit. This was still in many ways uh, a von Neumann based machine, but instead of it being the only processing unit, the primary CPU was interconnected to an array of 10 other inner CPUs. And so the primary CPU could uh, um, offshore a bunch of different, or a bunch of the same calculations to these things, or potentially even different calculations and wait for the results to come back. Uh, and so more processing potentially could be done at the same time. Right? But it's just like, uh, or it echoes the types of machines we see today, where we have uh, desktops, uh, you know, powerful machines with this core processor on the board, but then a sound card is plugged in, and that sound card has its own RAM and its own CPU, and the video card has its own RAM and its own CPU. And part of the CPU's, the primary CPU's task is to intercommunicate uh, with these other complete computer systems. Now also during this time, we see the introduction of what became known as supercomputers by Seymour Cray uh, via the company that bears his name. The third generation that evolves from this transistor-based uh, generation of computers is based on integrated circuits, which are invented in 1958. Now, an integrated circuit uh, is effectively just a bunch of transistors that might otherwise have been wired together on some board uh, to provide some function. Uh, laid out in a design stage, and then manufactured, suspended in a glob of goo. Right? So if you think about a computer chip uh, that you've seen inside of something, you know, this gray black mass that has uh, pins exposed from it, uh, the original integrated circuits, which is what that is, uh, effectively are just a bunch of transistors isolated in a particular space 
uh, with some reduced number of pins exposed, which means if you want to arrange transistors uh, together to perform some function like uh, binary anding or addition or comparisons, you could design how they would be arranged and then sort of automatically manufacture or stamp a chip that has uh, one or more of that functional unit in it and have its interfaces exposed with pins. So the input pins would be there, the output pins would be there, but you might have a single chip that provides you the capability of adding, uh, say, 16 uh, bit values together. Right? But nobody's wiring all of them up. And they're packed into a tiny, tiny space. So the machine are fundamentally smaller as a side effect of the integrated circuit rather than um, uh, putting together a bunch of transistors on a board. If you remember from when we were talking about vacuum tube machines going from uh, 10 tubes to 1 because we switched to binary, some of the same things are going to apply here. So if we have lots of transistors individually wired to boards and we replace that with mechanically produced integrated circuits that have a bunch of transistors, way more, in the same physical space than we used to have, that means the total size of an equivalent computer shrinks dramatically. And when the size shrinks, when the distance between the furthest points becomes closer together, we change the speed at which calculations happen. They can happen faster. Right? And because we're producing integrated circuits uh, mechanically, and we can do it very easily in comparison to what we were doing before that, we're also reducing the costs of the machines dramatically. So they're getting smaller, they're getting less expensive, and they're getting faster all at the same time. But what's interesting here is that in the integrated circuit era, we're really talking about an advancement of not a lot more than just putting more transistors in a smaller space right? and being able to put them there a little more easily. So the transistors, as I said, were invented in 1958. Uh, and very soon, we see uh, one of our more important computers in history come to light. And this is the IBM System 360 series. So it's not really a computer. It was a family of computers. And this system, uh, the IBM System 360 series, effectively introduced the first architectural family of computers. So before this, each computer was its own computer. Uh, and a company like DEC, while they might have produced uh, the PDP-1 and then the PDP-8 and the PDP-11, and they may have learned lessons from the previous ones and done some things similarly, these were effectively very different machines. In the IBM System 360 series, all of the machines had a common instruction set. Now, some of them uh, had some more advanced instructions, depending on whether your company was going to purchase um, the higher-end models or the lower-end models. But the core CPUs shared the same instruction set. And what's interesting here is that given you, if your company had one of these systems, as the chip became more advanced and new models were introduced, because it was in the same architectural family, you could take your existing system, uh, have someone from IBM show up, uh, remove uh, your, your primary CPU chip, and replace it with the newer upgraded model. And the old uh, system would continue to work, and your existing programs would continue to work without needing to be recompiled but they would get the benefit of improved speed and allow for the capability of new software functionality to be written, or at least uh, written in new ways because of a potentially upgraded instruction set. But there was always the core that was common. Now these machines uh, were so fast that when new ones were introduced, new CPUs uh, when the, in, within these were introduced, they were so fast uh, they could emulate the previous versions. And that's remarkable. And these things had astronomical memory, somewhere between 16 kilobytes in the low-end model all the way up to 128 kilobytes, which at this period of time 
is an amazing amount of memory. Moving forward, in the fourth generation, we have the introduction of what's known as VLSI. And VLSI stands for Very Large Scale Integration. This is from the 1980s on. But all that means is the very large scale integration of transistors into the same space suspended in a glob of goo. So it's just like integrated circuits. In fact, VLSI uh, makes circuits. It's just, it makes integrated circuits, but they are integrated circuits that have uh, exponentially more transistors fit into the same space. So again, if you can put more transistors that make up the functionality of the computer, fit instead of this big space into this space, right? then you've decreased the size between the furthest points and between the points of common contact, and so you've increased the speed. Because we're doing this with uh, improved manufacturing processes, we're also reducing the cost dramatically. Right? So they're smaller, faster, and cheaper. Because of VLSI technology, machines are so small and so cheap, we suddenly have the capability for a regular household to own their own computer system. And so we see the introduction of personal computers like Apple, the original Apple and the Apple IIe and IBM's PC. Uh, and IBM's PC uh, was originally introduced using a VLSI CPU um, called the Intel 8088. At the same time, we start to see the introduction of uh, personal computer peripherals. And while they may not be uh, full-on computer systems of their own at this particular period, uh, in, the, in the early 80s and so on, they nonetheless uh, have circuitry inside them uh, that is based on VLSI technology. Now these machines become so fast and so powerful and, and can have so much more memory because memory technology uh, improves because of VLSI as well. We can start to see things like the introduction of graphical user interfaces. As well, the machines are now so fast uh, that if you just took the transistor-based design of some machine of the past and said, well, with VLSI, I could just make that machine teeny tiny. Well, now you have a machine that's so ridiculously fast, uh, but it's based on the types of software that we were trying to program in the past. And so it would be based on sort of an antiquated approach. Uh, at the times before this, machines used something that we called CISC, Complex Instruction Set computers, the last C in, C in CISC, C-I-S-C, -S -C, uh, is computers. Uh, these machines have all kinds of cool instruction sets, uh, maybe exposed by microprograms uh, that we've talked about before. Here in uh, Utica, New York, or very near to us here in Utica, New York in the past, a company uh, called um, the Univac, I believe, and Univac made all these mini computers in the pre-VLSI days. And they had instruction sets uh, that were designed for the hotel and entertainment industry, uh, which included uh, such instructions as uh, machine instructions for, or at least instruction set architecture exposed machine instructions for things like open cash register drawer. Right? Now, this is clearly not a core function of a computer. Uh, and so, in the days of VLSI, a new idea was born. Let's focus machines because they're so fast and because our memory uh, is so exponentially increased in size. Let's focus this machine on very small numbers of core operations. And so, RISC computers were born. And the, the acronym RISC stands for Reduced Instruction Set Computer. And in a reduced instruction set computer, Instead of hundreds of instructions, you may have tens of instructions. You might have 30 or 40 instructions altogether. Uh, and they don't provide all of the immediate functionality that you would have gotten out of, say, 200 or 300 instructions from some other kind of computer before it. However, 
because the CPU was responsible for, for, for performing uh, an order of magnitude fewer operations, you didn't need as many transistors to perform the operations. So even if you didn't use VLSI, the device would shrink in size. But because we were using VLSI technology, it was hyper shrunk. And when things get hyper close together, the distances are extra small. And so while we had uh, minimal numbers of instructions, many of those instructions overlapped with the existing ones like add two numbers together, compare two numbers, do a Boolean and of some other numbers, right? It was the same major functions that were happening all the time. They were just the only thing left. So when you wanted something slightly more advanced, you had to synthesize it with potentially up to five uh, or ten more risk instructions than you would have had to before. But because the size was hyper-decreased and the complexity of the CPU was hyper-decreased, those instructions were so much faster that even though your programs were larger and they could fit into our new fancy big memories, they would still execute faster than if they had been written uh, on a machine that had all the complex instructions available to it so that you could write fewer lines of code. So now we're writing more assembly code but getting faster programs. Of course, we're also developing software technologies that allow us to develop code. So we're not really writing everything in assembly language. Uh, we're still doing an awful lot of it uh, in the 80s, uh, leading into the 90s. But we have the introduction of high-level language compilers uh, that are better and better. And so we are able to write in higher level languages and get those longer series of risk instructions to be produced by our compilers and then ultimately much faster programs and an overall improved user experience. The fifth generation, which we'll call the embedded generation, uh, launches off in the early 90s when the Japanese government invests uh, you know, half or $500 million or so uh, into getting, getting computing uh, devices smaller and smaller so that we can, we can take computer chips and put them, uh, embed them into existing devices. And so this leads to the types of things that we see as peripheral devices of today, which are fundamentally their own working computers. And there was also a, a steer here towards artificial intelligence. Uh, at this time, we're seeing the introduction of hardware, software, co-design, where uh, systems are being developed uh, with hardware that is effectively a computer uh, to replace the design of custom circuits and software that implements the function of those previous custom circuits. Uh, and then that software uh, is rendered down into a binary, which is flashed directly into the hardware uh, so that uh, we can ship a product that appears to be uh, all hardware uh, and is as fast as a custom circuit but without the same development times and costs. PDAs are introduced at this time, uh, most notably the Newton and the Palm Pilot appear. Uh, mobile phones begin to be introduced. Suddenly things like watches, uh, refrigerators, microwaves, and cars all have uh, computers and potentially many computers uh, embedded into them and intercommunicating. And that leads us to what I would call uh, the current generation of computing, which I refer to as the, the age of hyperconnectivity. Um, this is not an uh, industry-wide technical term. This is just what I call it. Uh, and then in the age of hyperconnectivity, we are really relying on the creation and advancement of multi-core CPU technology. Right? As a part of this generation, we're seeing uh, very reliable high-speed networks, both wired and wireless. Uh, and more than we saw even in the embedded generation, basically everything seems to have become a computer. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is because we can. We can make many products that had custom electronic circuits uh, in them before much faster and much cheaper by developing them as uh, with embedded CPUs and embedded firmware. 
uh, to run custom or to run programs that will never even be changed, uh, but they are designed fundamentally in a different way uh, and tested in a fundamentally different way than when we were building custom circuits for these devices. Right. So, like toys, and things all have little CPUs uh, embedded in them. We're seeing a lot more remote device services, and I say device here quite keenly because I don't just mean remote services for your laptop and desktop computers, but I mean in these everything that we carry around <laughs> devices. So phones that we carry around, our watches that can talk through our phones to networks and so on. We're getting all kinds of services on an individual device from other devices or remote computer systems, vastly remote, much more powerful systems. And again, uh, everything is sort of relying on each other. This brings us to, again, the Internet of Things, which we would not have if it were not for these networks and the connectivity and the ability to produce low-cost electronic devices based on uh, reprogrammable computing models. Now, uh, this has also led to the cultural expectation of instant access to information. And in hyperconnectivity, and the reason I call it hyperconnectivity, uh, is because a fundamental part of my life has changed uh, as we have shifted into this generation. In the past, when I would go to meetings, business meetings, one of the things that would happen is, uh, and it's common today, people would bring up an issue of contention or some kind of value that they didn't uh, know uh, precisely. So you might say, I don't know exactly what the, the number was on that, uh, I'll get that to you later, or I don't know exactly what year that was introduced, I'll find out and report it back to the group uh, sometime after the meeting. So you would leave a meeting with at least partially a to-do list of pieces of information you needed to acquire and redistribute and possibly use in the next meeting because you didn't have it there in the first meeting. In the age of hyperconnectivity, of course, and you do this all the time, uh, someone will uh, proclaim a piece of information or be lacking a, a piece of information, and it doesn't even have to be important. You know, who was the guy who did the voiceover for that uh, weird movie about the environment where plastic bags uh, are concerned about their existence? You know, someone could just look that up right away on their device, and instead of waiting till you had another meeting. To continue the conversation, you say things like, wait a minute, let me find that out right now. And if you're in a business meeting setting, someone will say, I don't have this at the moment, and uh, I'll have my partner here look that up and we'll get right back to it. And then you don't wait till the next meeting. Right? And that's because we are hyper-connected. And in this age, our systems, our computer-based systems, are both pervasive and ubiquitous. And I want you to... Uh, Remember these two words because they are critically important and you, you need to understand them to understand the value of the jobs that you are seeking by learning uh, computer science or network computer security uh, or information, te uh, information technology, whatever you may be getting yourself into or in information systems. Uh, pervasive, uh, or I say pervasive because the computers are everywhere, right? so they're pervasive. But they're also ubiquitous. And what that means is they're not only everywhere, but in most of the places where computers exist in our modern world, in our hyper-connected world, we don't actually even think of those things as computers. Our smartphones, we might be, you know, blurring the lines and thinking of those things as computers. But my Sonicare toothbrush, I do not think of as a computer, even though it has a 32-bit processor inside of it. And that's the difference. You know, when you put on the brakes, you're not thinking about that as a computer system. You're thinking about it as a lever. It's the brake. Right? But really, that's just an input vessel or an input device that interacts with some set of computer systems. And that's what's so remarkable about the hyperconnected world today. The computers, the things we are going to be working on in our, our futures, are in everything. And that's great for us. But they're also ubiquitous, so people don't even recognize them. They just blend into the fabric of our lives. And not to mention the fact that there's 
uh, computable fabrics now, right? So this is a wild and interesting uh, new world. Now, all of this happens because of the growth of the number of transistors that we can put into the same physical space. Uh, and the growth rate of that is captured in something that's referred to as Moore's Law. Now, Moore's Law is introduced, well, he didn't introduce it, but it comes from a very simple history. Uh, at Intel back in 1965, Gordon Moore sat down and uh, took out a piece of semi-log paper uh, and started to plot out the number of transistors uh, that were able to be fit into a particular size space uh, every year since the introduction of the, the transistor-based technology at Intel. Uh, and what he ended up with was a straight line. And on semi-log paper, a uh, straight line really means exponential growth. Uh, and so uh, he predicted at least for some time that we would see uh, that continued exponential growth. And what he saw was that the number of transistors uh, in a given space doubled about uh, every year or so. Now, uh, that has changed slightly. It slowed down a little bit over time. It's still exponential growth. Uh, but what we call Moore's Law today really states uh, that the number of transistors doubles about every 18 months or so. And that has pretty much held true uh, since 1965. But there are limits that we are starting to hit. And as a side effect, we're going in new directions. But if the number of transistors, uh, especially over all that period, was going to be growing exponential, there are some natural side effects. First of all, because we're able to put more transistors, uh, the um, manufacturing process must improve in order for us to do that, that means it's going to reduce the cost of our computer systems, right? And so that's great. Uh, so we're going to have reduced cost systems that turn out to be faster. And that means more people are getting access to faster computers. And that means they're not just satisfied with the applications they used to run. They want those same applications and more. And they want each of those applications to exert more power, to be more powerful. Right? And so that uh, feeds the cycle to, to have, uh, you know, for competition to have more inexpensive and even faster computers with more apps that are more powerful. And that goes on and on. Now Moore's Law today has fundamentally shifted because we're getting close to a number of these different limits that I alluded to before. And so instead of saying that the number of transistors doubles every 18 months or so, now, uh, an evolving version of Moore's Law is that the number of CPU cores, because we're in the age of multi-core, the number of CPU cores on every, on every CPU is going to be doubling about every two years. Right? And so we have cell processors today. Now, uh, truth be told, this kind of solution to get around some of the limits that we were hitting before is really kind of a low-hanging fruit solution. That's not to say that multi-core systems are simplistic uh, or, or simple-minded, nothing like that at all. Uh, but realistically, even if we have multiple computational cores in a, in a single CPU die, uh, the hard problems are going to still be at the single cell level, the single core level. That's where your primary bottlenecks are going to be for any in individual sequence of computations, because those are going to happen still on a single core. So I hope you've enjoyed this review of computing history from a generational perspective. Um, please let me know uh, if you have any questions at all.